Well, the backgrounds for our slide has changed, as you can tell. I try to somewhat pick around the theme, and I've been holding off. There are so many beautiful fall backgrounds. No, it's summertime. I'm not going to do it. Uh, but I had to give in. I, you'll remember that last Sunday was actually the first day of fall. Um, so I'm officially into fall. We're going to call this series, I'm calling it Fall Break, uh, because it's a little bit of a break from our book study. We just finished the book of Esther a few weeks ago. I want to go verse by verse. Well, this, from now through probably the beginning of our Christmas series, uh, we'll probably do topical things. And you remember a few, probably a month or so ago, I asked you to share some verses with me that maybe you thought you'd like to hear preached on. I had a few of my own. Uh, so that's what this series is going to be. I'll preview it for us at the end of today, but it'll kind of be a kind of a topical study, hit or miss. You will not be able to judge what we're talking about by the titles in any way. Uh, it's just I like to use alliteration, so often they start with the same thing, and you'll see those. But it's really a time for us to begin to, now school has started, we're kind of settling into a, a new calendar, a new uh, sort of ritual. Um, summer vacations are over, mine specifically, uh, and we're kind of, let's just take some time to reevaluate and reset and prepare ourselves for the rest of the year. Uh, but before we do that, uh, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer and then we'll get into this this morning. Father, we come to you this morning uh, so thankful for the privilege to read your word, to have a source of hope and truth for us, uh, to know you and your word. Uh, we just come with expectant hearts this morning. May your spirit even now begin to move in us through these words that we read that have been passed down from the ages. Help us to again today to be reminded of their everlasting truth and hope that they bring to us. And God's people said, Amen. So a few weeks ago, or at least a little while ago, I ran across, somebody was posting on social media, a verse from the book of Acts. Uh, and I thought, well, that's kind of where I wanted to go with this. Go ahead and put that quote up on the screen for us. He's quoting Acts chapter 19, verse 32. And it says this, you can go back and read the context if you want. It says, The assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people did not even know they were there. And I thought, well, that's a good way to describe many places in our world today. Some people are shouting one thing. Some people are shouting another. I was actually at a couple meetings this week, and I thought there was people shouting one thing, some people shouting another, and then some had really no idea why they were there. They were just to, there to protest and whatever they had to protest. So I wanted to start with that this morning because confusion is still a problem today. I don't know about you, but I have multiple news sources, and they can often give me conflicting information on what is the truth and the reality of the situation. So I wanted to help us get some clarity through this. Uh, so I wanted to start by, here's our, these are not on the screen for you. If you want to write them down, that's fine, but you know I always send you the notes on Monday. But I thought I had some goals for this series as we talk about a topical study jumping around from verse to verse. The first thing, uh, first goal for us would be to be, to have clarity from being grounded in and committed to the Word of God. My goal would be that when we get to the end of this series, we say, I'm more than ever believe and committed to the Word of God as the sole source of truth for my life. All right? uh, secondly, I'd have a goal for us to become more mature in the faith, as Paul often uses that word, for us to become better apologists. If you work in that, what I word, when I say that word, I'm using a kind of a Bible class terminology, the study of apologetics is the defense of the Christian faith. So I know that through this, we're going to come through some questions. You go, yeah, I've always wondered about that, about Christianity. Maybe you have all your questions answered. If not, then just endure and add to whatever I have to add for us. Uh, but Peter writes in 1 Peter 2.15 that we're to be prepared to give an answer. It's my hope that that happens through this series, that we can answer some things that we've always had in our own minds or maybe others have other questions that others have given us. Uh, finally, and thirdly, that we would be in tune with the Spirit, ultimately not just that we're learning things and understanding, comprehending things, but we are exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit. Because of this, something comes out of us, and we are in challenged and encouraged to move forward in our faith, uh, that we'd be encouraged and challenged also by the truth. So you say, well, that's some pretty lofty goals. I, I would really wish this for anyone inside or outside of the church, but I feel a particular responsibility as the pastor of this church that if you gather here with us to worship on a regular Sunday, that we are equipped and capable, we understand the Scripture for what it is and are able to apply it to our everyday life. So where would we turn to accomplish these goals? As you hopefully have already figured that out, we would turn to Scripture. I want to share you a couple more reasons why we would do this this morning. In the book of Ephesians, 
Paul says that when we become mature in the faith, in Ephesians chapter 4, he says, then we will no longer be immature like children. This is Paul's goal for those who are reading his letter. He says, we won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like that's what the world is trying to do. One day I can think this, and the other day I can think that, and I have to return to Scripture and say, okay, well, this is, this is what God says about it. And we will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Now, that's a New Living Translation, uh, but you can look that up. It's close, it's close to the idea. You understand that the word truth appears again. When you don't know what the truth is, you get tossed back and forth because you can, getting inf- like I said, getting information from various sources for what's true. Paul then writes later to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 3. He says, although I hope to come to you soon, I'm writing you these instructions so that if I'm delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. All right, so we're always going to come back to that. That's why Paul says this is my purpose for reading. In reality, we're going to come back to a lot of Paul's writings through this because he's writing to the church to give them instructions on what is the truth of God and how does the church live it out. So we ask the question, how do we arrive at this destination that Paul wants us to get to? This destination of clarity and truth. Well, Ruth read us this morning, a passage from 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, about the nature of Scripture and its origin. I'll read that for us again. It says, Above all, you must under this is Peter writing, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. He said, it's not just some guy, something that some guy made up, and he says it should be this way. He says, For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now, we could spend, and I have spent, courses and hours studying this idea about inspiration is probably the word that your text uses, about this being carried along by the Holy Spirit, and there's a sailboat illustration. There's all kinds of other illustrations. But the point of this whole verse is that we return to Scripture because it's not a book, just the words of men. It, is, it is, has God's hand in it and on it and has, was pushing it even as it was being written. So I wanted to go to our main text this morning as we begin this series, 2 Timothy chapter 3. And as I laid, as I said, as I laid out this study, I realized that we're going to come back to 2 Timothy a lot, which is Timothy was a young pastor and Paul was writing instructions to him. Uh, Actually, we'll come to it even this morning, but even further down in the weeks ahead. Um, And according to my records, I was shocked to learn that I have never preached on this verse before. Now, if you were ever a leader or a kid in Awana, you know that this, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, is one of the core verses that you had to memorize. We're going to get to the other one today, too. But I thought, why have I never preached on this verse? I mean, it just, I think for, for a while, things become so obvious and so plain to us that we see it. And then I thought, well... This is the point that I want to emphasize this morning. And then as I began to study the verse, like this whole thing unfolded again, I thought, well, there's really a lot there. We can spend some time on that. Um, So we're going to have, as I said, we're going to have a lot of verses on the screen today uh, just to give us a solid base on where we're starting. If you want to write the references down, that's fine. Uh, But as I said, I'll send you the notes tomorrow. But let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All Scripture is inspired... By God, we just heard that just a moment ago, right? Peter told us that in Second Second Peter, and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness. Now, as you memorize it, even as I remember as a kid, you just you can just rattle off those words. Sometimes when we're kids, we just memorize the words in sequence, and we don't actually think about what it means. I'm going to slow us down a little bit today, and let's pick that apart. Verse 17, here's the purpose for it, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So why start with this verse in 2 Timothy? Because it reminds us of what Peter just said. It's inspired by God. It's not a regular book. Its origins are not merely human. It is the sole basis for authority. Well, I can read the New York Times, the Washington Post, you name it, and it will not be a source of authority like Scripture is. And in this day, as we talked about earlier, in this day of confusion, and differing opinions and different viewpoints and different, uh, what's the strong little buzzword I'm thinking of that people use to say, well, you see it that way and I see it this way. All right, well, we need to be clear about what is it that God says about it. Uh, I relish this, this pat, the, the book of Scripture that's origin is greater than whatever man can come up with. We need it to guide us on this difficult journey. I can't imagine trying to go through trying to figure out what is 
what is right and what is wrong, what is true and what is false in this world without a book like Scripture to, turn, to return to. Without it, we're like a ship lost at sea with no stars and no map, just adrift in this endless black night. So many years ago, I don't know, maybe some of you are familiar with this, I saw a presentation by Frank Peretti, who's a Christian author. I don't think he's with us anymore. But he did this presentation called The Chair, and it was based on this idea of absolute truth, and he put this chair down, and it's kind of describing a little bit of what I'm talking about today, that Scripture is the chair. It's a source of truth. I could wander away, but I always knew where the chair was. I'd go this way in the chair. And he, gets, he gets through all of that and describes how reliable, how trustworthy this source of absolute truth was, and then he picks up the chair and walks off with it. You know, and you get, you get the point that the chair has to be in the same place. Well, that's the same way that we look at God and at His Word. That it doesn't move, it can't be moved. It's more than a chair, it's a solid rock, it's a firm foundation. So I wanted us to, to come back to that idea this morning. We could all use some instruction on how we live in the world. What does this verse say that the study of scriptures is to do to us? There's like one, two, three, four things that it does to us. The first thing, it's profitable, it's good for us for teaching and instruction, which is good news because otherwise we've wasted a lot of Sundays here. When we open up the Word, I'm expecting us to be taught something, to hear something about God. We could all use some instruction on how to live in this world. How do I go about my day-to-day -day life? How do I answer the questions that I have? How do I treat people around me? What is my attitude and purpose about life? How do I face death? How do I deal with difficulties in my life? How can I handle money and or influence? How do I view my work? How do I view my family? Some of these we're going to unpack in this series and revisit again. But all these questions and so many more are waiting for us if we'll just turn to Scripture to find them. And that's why we pay attention to what Paul also wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, a chapter before this, when he says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman that does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Now there you realize, hey, there's the key verse of, of Awana program, a workman who needs not to be ashamed. But that's the point of Awana. It's the point of us returning to Scripture that if we handle it correctly, we can go into the world and not be ashamed of it. We're able to defend God and His word and what it says. We've so incorporated it into our lives that it, it becomes practical for us and for those who, who witness our lives around us. So when we read and know and study and understand the scriptures, we'll not be ashamed because we handle the truth correctly. So that's the first thing this verse tells us. It's profitable. It's good for us for teaching. Second thing, we're not so excited to see because it tells us something we don't necessarily want to hear, right? It's profitable for teaching, but also for rebuking, for discipline. I think the King James word is reproof. We are being rebuked. It's this part of Scripture that many people just don't like. That it reveals the truth about ourselves as sinners, and people think, well, I don't. I want to be thinking that I'm a good person, right? I'm measuring the scale of good deeds and bad deeds, because that's how God lets me into heaven. And we know that also, if we know Scripture, that that's not how it works. But people don't want to hear that they're sinners, because then their bad deeds begin to outweigh the good, and they start to think, well, am I really going to be able to go to heaven when I die? The, there's this reminder that we are not perfect. We even see even the, the most heroic features and characters in Scripture are not perfect. Abraham messed up. David messed up. You name the person other than Jesus Christ, and there's something wrong in their life. No one wants to be told they're a sinner. We Ultimately, we know that, but we don't want to be reminded of it. We don't like to be rebuked or disciplined. That's why the author of the Hebrews writes it this way, Hebrews 4, chapter 4, verse 12. For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit. It cuts to the core of us, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. That's what, that's what hurts about Scripture when it's rebuking us. We realize that it's a two-edged sword. It cuts on both sides. It cuts coming in and going out on both sides of the blade. It exposes our weakness and our sin. It reveals the deepest parts of us parts that we'd rather just assume are not there. And talk about, but I'm a good person. Yeah, I, sure, I think some bad thoughts, and I do some bad things once in a while, but really I'm a good person. Scripture says, no, you're not. Scripture's for rebuking us. 
It cuts and reveals not merely to wound us, which of course it does, but thirdly, Scripture is there to correct and reform those things that are wrong in us. You could start all the way back in the Old Testament with the Ten Basic Commandments, which already reveal to us the covetous nature within ourselves. If you think about the Ten Commandments as just a basic law for men getting along with each other, there's a pretty solid core there. Because there's so many commandments, it's like, yeah, I'd probably, if you didn't tell me not to do that, I'd probably do that. Right? And people understand that that's true by the Ten Commandments. Now, there's so much more in Scripture than that, but that's a, just a, a, a base layer to start with. Or you can go back to the origins of man and find out that we were deceitful and deceptive and rebellious from the very beginning. Scripture helps us to understand that and try to correct that in our lives. The purpose is not merely to reveal, but to correct. When we get to the, to the New Testament, to the right side of the book, we have the wonderful teaching of Jesus who lived and walked with common fishermen. Thank goodness Jesus wasn't walking among the elite and the most righteous. He walked with tax collectors, and he modeled and taught the ways that, that God would have us to live. And it's just a quick glimpse at Scripture as a whole there, of what's the, what's, how does it correct us. We have not just words of instruction, but also the model of the life of Jesus Christ. And that brings us next to this training in righteousness, or instruction, maybe your, your passage says. So we, answer, we try to answer the question, what is the best way to live as God would have us to live, and how do we do that? It's, there's training, instruction going on. We are not righteous beings to start with. We aren't born that way. We are born self-seeking and liars and greedy and covetous, and we need to be trained and retrained. God has given us, the, whole, the Word teaches us, that God has given us the Holy Spirit to move us in that process. What does the Spirit do? Corrects and convicts of sin, righteousness, and judgment, right? So He's not left to ourselves to be convicted. We have the Word and the Spirit that both come into our lives and pierce us with like sword and say, this is not correct. You need to get this right. And then we have the Scripture to instruct us in the model of Jesus Christ. It should be something that we desire to be trained, to become more like Christ. The author of Psalm 119 writes over and over again about his desire for God's Word. And this, I want to read you a few verses from that in the message. Psalm 119, verse uh, 32 says this. I'll run the course. Now, hear the author's desire to do what God asked for him. I'll run the course you lay out for me. If you'll just show me how. God, teach me lessons for living so I can stay the course. Give me insight so I can do what you tell me. My whole life, one long, obedient response. Guide me down the road of your commandments. Now, Psalm 119 is filled with that. It's the longest chapter in Scripture. And this is like every other verse, I forget the, the actual count. How many of those verses talk about, I love the law of the Lord, I meditate on it day and night, I love His commands and His principles. Keep using those same words over and over. Maybe you want to read that this week. But whether we like it or not, whether we want to or not, whether we want to be taught and rebuked and corrected and trained, that's what Scripture does. That's why it's so important and so good for, the, for us to be in it, to be desiring it. But it's also good for people who don't desire it. It's correcting and convicting and revealing to us who we truly are, which, as I said, we don't often want to see. That verse in Scripture doesn't say the Word is only effective for those who go to it willingly and openly. It's also good for people who don't want to be there and don't want to hear it. See, there's something Spirit-filled about the Scriptures that when someone reads it and meditates on it and thinks about it or hears it for the first time, that it begins to ring bells in their head and in their heart and say, you know, I might need to think about this some more. We'll study this some more. You remember that the prophet Isaiah writes in chapter 55. He says, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty. How many times... Christian, follower of Christ, believer, have you thought that you left that conversation about God and His Spirit and His Word and it was fruitless? Take comfort that Isaiah says, I've been there too, but God promises us that His Spirit and His Word do not come back void. That's the King James Word. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. See, it's God's purposes in Scripture, right? It's Often we have a goal in mind too, right? We want 
We're going to read the scripture and X, Y, Z is going to happen. But it doesn't happen. So we feel that God's not listened to us or his word has been ineffective. God says, no, it's my purposes, not yours. Finally, as we go back to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 17, Paul writes to Timothy, the reason for all this rebuking and this correcting and this training and this teaching is so that every man of God may be, King James says, perfect or truly furnished or thoroughly equipped or completed. Because we'll never get there without Scripture guiding us and completing us and correcting us. It's not just so that we can be satisfied with ourselves and our knowledge of Scripture, but that verse ends with proficient to do every good work. It's not just the fact that you know stuff or that you understand or you can teach theology 1, 2, and 3 at the nearest Bible college or that you can lead a Bible study wherever you may be. It has a purpose that we are equipped to do every good work. We said that's one of our goals for this series. So let me give you some highlights for this series. Just going to briefly read some verses, some truths from Scripture that will remind us or encourage us. First off, we're going to talk about the theme of truth quite often. John 17, 17, Jesus prays over his disciples. He says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And God's people said, you hear nothing else today, hear that. God, sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. Psalm 119, the sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous rules endures forever. Toward the end of this series, we're going to have a message called Lies and Truth. It's really kind of the, the centerpiece of this whole series. And I think I already have written in the notes that I've spent more time working on that message than any other message I've ever preached before. It's been in years in the making. It's the Sunday before Election Day. We're going to talk about lies and truth. And we're going to let God discern for us. Another week, we're going to talk about perseverance, fighting, and finishing. 2 Timothy 4, 7, Paul writes to Timothy, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. We're going to talk about what it means to fight and finish. Uh, another week is called resting and reaping. This is one of my the ones that I one of the reasons I started this series. Galatians chapter six verse nine. It just encourages me just to even see it here on the page. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. I could preach a whole series on just that verse. So we conclude today with we're gonna, those are some things that we're going to see in the weeks ahead. But we conclude today by being reminded that as the psalmist in one nineteen writes, "Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path." And that's what we're going to constantly return. Let's pray, Father. We come so thankful for this truth that we have in your word, this source of hope and encouragement, and a source that is just solid as a rock that we can constantly return to in this time of uh, political turmoil around us, of violence. Uh, even here in our uh, in our local high school, we had violence this week. Lord, we realize that all of these things are relevant and practical for us on a daily basis. We pray that you use your word to correct and discipline and reform us, but also to build and encourage and transform us. Lord, anchor us in your truth. Guide us in the path of righteousness. And help us to know you and know you more. to share communion with you this morning. Pray that you have your elements. If you don't, we can do that right now. But I wanted to remind us briefly